Welcome to the first edition of Methodist Unscripted. Ha ha ha. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Jeff Walton. And today is, let me check my calendar, March 4th, Monday. Okay, from time to time, we have Jeff Walton on our program. He's with IRD. He does a lot of the reporting and uh, uh, whatnots within the denominations, including Anglican, but other than Anglican. And there's not just Anglican news on Anglican Unscripted. Sometimes we cover other denominations that are going to go through what we've been going through or who have not gone through what we've gone through. And I'm just making sure my sound is up over here. I just I pressed a button. If not, I'll fix it in the mix. Um, and so uh, Jeff was in St. Louis for the Rumble. And I thought he and I could talk about what happened in the United Methodist Church this uh, last week because it's important to reflect on what a global church does when faced with um, changes to its doctrine and what um, more local churches do and local uh, provinces and denominations do, uh, i.e. look at the Anglican Communion or look at the Episcopal Church. Um, Jeff, I read all the news coming up to the uh, meeting in St. Louis that said, hey, they're splitting. And there's no way they're going to hold the line. There's just too many liberals in the church, and they're going to vote to have um, same-sex clergy and same-sex marriage. And I go, oh, boy, I wouldn't be surprised. I've seen the best of the churches fall to the agenda. Why not the United Methodist? Why am I waking up a couple days later completely surprised that that didn't happen? Yeah, um a lot of people were really shocked, especially if you saw Emma Green's article in The Atlantic. Uh, the headline was, I believe, uh, Conservative Christians Take Over the United Methodist Church. Um, and that was a big system shock to a lot of people. Obviously, people like you and me who operate in mainline Christian circles, this seems counter to what we've experienced in Presbyterian Church USA, the Episcopal Church, etc. Um, but uh, there's some really important different things that were lining up and uh, my boss, Mark Tooley, and my colleague, John Lamparis, who are both lifelong United Methodists, have seen this coming for years and have been working very carefully and very strategically in order to bring this about. Uh, so what we can talk about also is some of the differences between the United Methodist Church and how it's organized compared to uh, what many of your viewers know is the Episcopal Church and the way it's organized. And that made a key difference. Uh, The United Methodist Church is not an American church. It is a global denomination. Um, About 43% of the delegates at the recent general conference were from uh, Africa, and uh, many have also come from Southeast Asia, especially the Philippines, and that makes a big difference in what's decided. Okay, so they voted, and they finally got around to voting, and they counted up the votes, and they decided that they're not going to have um, clergy that are uh, in same-sex relationships or uh, allow for same-sex uh, blessings and marriages. Did I got that right? Mm-hmm. That, that, and, that is correct. And, and believe it or not, that is the existing policy of the United Methodist Church since 1972. Mm-hmm. That was not changed. It was preserved. Uh, what changed were a package of enforcement mechanisms that were put into effect. Um, there were basically competing plans. Uh, one was a progressive-backed plan called the One Church Plan, which would basically so be a bad. local option. That was bad. Yes, that was yeah, so bad. Yeah, I've got a little, I've got a little <laughs> button here for the, uh, the One Church Plan that I picked up at one of their events. So that's one of my uh-huh. little church memorabilia items. Uh-huh. And um, the One Church Plan basically said that different local, juris- local regions that are known as annual conferences, that's the Methodist equivalent of a diocese, uh, that they would be able to choose for themselves whether they wanted to do same-sex marriage or have uh, clergy and same-sex relationships that were non-celibate. And uh, that plan failed, and it failed by about 56% of the vote. Um, so uh, that was something that the entire institutional hierarchy of the Methodist Church had gone all out to push that plan. About two-thirds of the Council of Bishops uh, promoted it, uh, and uh many, many U.S. delegates were backing it. In fact, there were a number of progressive delegates who said that they literally did not know a single person who did not support the One Church Plan. Well, uh, now however, we're... <laughs> they were, yeah, they were living in basically a, an echo chamber. 
And that's the big difference here between how the United Methodist Church works. It's a global church, and mm -hmm. it's a kind of, kind of a representative government. Uh, yeah. As far as, um, it's not like we have in the Episcopal Church where um, each diocese has the same votes. Um, mm -hmm. If your church is growing, uh, your portion of the church is growing, you have more votes. If your church is shrinking, you have less votes. Tell me how that works. Yeah, well, uh, again, to, to contrast this with the Episcopal Church, uh, many of your viewers know that in the Episcopal Church, if you go to general convention, each diocese receives a deputation of eight people, four elected laity and four clergy. And it doesn't matter how big or how small your diocese is, you get eight. Uh, so if you're from Diocese of Dallas, you get eight, and Diocese of Dallas has tens of thousands of members. Uh, if you are from the Diocese of Northern Michigan, which has well under two thousand members, you also get eight. It's um, not particularly democratic, but then again, neither is the U.S. Senate, so there's your comparison. Uh, right. In contrast, the <laughs> United Methodist General Conference is organized more like the House of Representatives. Uh, delegates represent units of population. So if your annual conference grows, uh, which many of the annual conferences in the southeast United States and in sub-Saharan Africa are growing, uh, then you receive an allocation of more delegate seats. Uh, if your uh, diocese, or excuse me, not diocese, annual conference is shrinking in size, then what happens is you receive fewer uh, delegate slots. And that's the case in the West Coast of Methodism, which is the most liberal part of the United Methodist Church. Um, just to give you an idea of how this plays out, the, the Western jurisdiction of the United Methodist Church, which is all Methodist churches uh, west of the Rocky Mountains, uh, they will have 26 delegates out of a total of 862 delegates at the next general conference. That's a very small number. It's less than 3%. Yes. Um, the North Georgia annual conference, which is just the Atlanta area, has more delegates than that. So uh, what you're getting is a change where, where the church, if it's not been evangelistic, if, if people aren't having kids, if they aren't making the gospel known, and they're shrinking, then they're not going to have the same voice as a place where uh, people are growing. And this is important for your viewers to understand because it doesn't just say what happened at the recent general conference, although that's an important factor. It also tells us what's gonna happen in the next few general conferences as well. There will be a general conference that's regularly scheduled in 2020 in Minneapolis. And we already know what the delegate layout is gonna look like. The liberal US annual conferences are gonna lose 22 delegates. And those are almost all going to sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so that's going to shift things dramatically. Another key point I want to share with your viewers is the, that because so many of these delegates are overseas, they have to get visas to come here. And even though uh, traditionalists were successful at this recent general conference, they did so absent about 31 delegates who had empty seats. And these were primarily people from sub-Saharan Africa who were not able to get visas. Now, we believe that it's much more likely with more advanced notice that they will have visas in 2020. So combine that, 31 uh, African delegates will be back in their seats, plus an additional 22 delegates uh, assigned to them, means you're gonna have a swing in, the, in that direction of probably about 53 delegates. And that's going to be, um, almost all of those are probably going to be biblically orthodox people. That's a significant thing, and it's going. I realize this is a lot of numbers I'm throwing out. No, but no. It shows that <laughs> the trajectory is very favorable to those who are advocating for biblical orthodoxy within the United Methodist Church. The irony is not lost on me that one day, a generation from now, the only surviving uh, Orthodox denomination may be the United Methodist Church, uh, a breakaway of the Anglican Church. Um, it just it, it, the irony is it, it is very thick on this Monday morning. Um, so I also think it's not over yet. I think there's going to be a way that the liberals are going to fight this tooth and nail and bog it down. That's what they did mm -hmm. in all their lawsuits. That's what they do in mm -hmm. the Episcopal Church and the Episcopal seminaries. Um, they learned very early on that you win this 
by just a little um, doubt and you put smoldering in the seminaries you put uh, questioning in the in early teachings then you take over the books and the libraries and you take over the catechism um, then the prayer book and then the church is all yours uh, do you see something like that in the future of the uh, United Methodists? Well, just because they lost at this general conference does not mean that the progressive delegates are going to suddenly decide to uh, hand over the keys to the church. Um, no one expects that to happen. Uh, and in fact, again, to give an Episcopal church example, uh, when the biblically Orthodox lost in 2003, uh, there weren't a lot of Episcopal churches that were conservative that left uh, after 2003. Um, most of them stuck around through the 2006 General Convention and then started leaving following that, and of course the election of Catherine Jefford Shorey as presiding bishop. So we don't expect many progressive Methodists to walk away in the coming months. There might be a few, uh, but as far as churches or annual conferences departing, um, we think that that'll not happen until after the 2020 annual conference. And um, another thing I wanted to share with you as well and with your viewers is this concept of uh, who is controlling and who is teaching in the seminaries. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Methodism has 13 accredited seminaries uh, that are authorized to, um, that, that, that not only are they authorized to train United Methodist pastors, but they also receive significant financial support from the denomination. Uh, this includes um, Duke Divinity School, um, uh, uh, Drew uh, University in uh, New Jersey, um, uh, Garrett Evangelical in Chicago, uh, 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 a bunch of others. And um, most of these are actually quite progressive. Um, however, there is, well, the one exception is United Seminary in Dayton, Ohio, which is, um, which is, which is many that's uh, their, Orthodox yeah, voices there. That's the, the uh, but that's, that's the, the only one they have. Seminary. Yeah. Um, the, but uh, in addition to that 13, there is a broader uh, network of seminaries who are not officially United Methodist, but are authorized to graduate uh, United Methodist pastors. And the largest of these is Asbury Seminary in Kentucky. Um, Asbury is the 800-pound gorilla within evangelical Methodism. Even though it's not an official Methodist seminary, it's a uh, seminary in the Wesleyan tradition, um, but uh, that, that they are authorized, though, to train seminarians. So even though they're not an official United Methodist seminary, one-third of all new Methodist pastors in the United States come through Asbury. And that's amazing. Uh, and that has made a significant difference in uh, the, the, the church and a lot of its its new pastors coming through. So what we're probably going to see coming forward is, some, just like in the Episcopal Church, that saw Episcopal Divinity School and some others shudder over the last uh, decade, um, we're probably going to see some of the most liberal Methodist seminaries consolidate or shudder. Um, there's at least three that we're keeping tabs on that we think are not going to make it uh, much farther in the future. And um, what we'd like to see happen is for uh, the United Methodist General Conference and the body known as the University Senate, which does education oversight, uh, for them to authorize more evangelical seminaries, including places like Gordon-Conwell, uh, to graduate um, Methodist seminarians. And uh, that would be very helpful. Um, so we think that these are incremental steps that are, are positive and that'll bode well for the future of the denomination, but they don't mm -hmm. happen overnight. And uh, this is something that is going to require a significant fight going forward, but we believe that the, the tide of battle has turned and is going in a direction that that is very beneficial to the biblically orthodox within united methodism so for my viewers who like to comment i would like you to put links to stories of other denominations congratulating the united methodist church for holding the line see if you can find any out there i didn't hear anything from the roman catholic church the lutheran church uh anybody Nobody congratulated them for having a tough meeting and doing the right thing. So if you could find something, I'd like to see it in, in the comments. Jeff, I want to thank one you for your time. I, yep, I ahead, do one little thing I'd like to add here to throw <laughs> sure. in that I think might be worthwhile. Uh -huh. I think this is an open door to evangelical engagement between uh, in an ecumenical uh, uh, open door between the United Methodist Church going forward and ACNA. Um, maybe not right now, but in a year and a half. Uh, I think that's a very good possibility. And there are a lot of people within United Methodism 
who are very favorable towards ACNA and want to have a good relationship with it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that, that we can do as Anglicans is encourage that process along. Uh, what that looks like is building relationships with um, Methodist churches in your area that are biblically orthodox, getting to know the pastors if you're clergy, and uh, looking to, to sponsor events together that are, are good things that help build the kingdom, and um, kind of see if, you, if we can build that ec ecumenism of the trenches, so to speak, that will eventually lead to more high-level contacts. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a really good case that can be made for um, ACNA and the United Methodist Church to to come into a a growing relationship with one another. I do know of talks that have happened in the past, and I certainly hope they are uh, fruitful and will occur again in the future. Jeff, I do want to thank you for your time, for your encouragement, and uh, uh, Inside Baseball. This is the fourth attempt we made to tape because for some reason my <laughs> Skype <laughs> gave up the ghost last Friday and just like, I'm not going to talk to Jeff on your behalf. I'm like, ah. So I'm glad that finally worked out. Jeff, I'll catch you later. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Jeff Walton, and it's March 4th, 2019. Yeah, geez. And this is kind of the first unofficial, official episode of Methodist Unscripted, because the Methodists don't have anything like Methodist TV or Methodist Unscripted, so we're going to help them out. I'm also going to do an interview with another famous Methodist. Well, you're not a famous Methodist. With a famous Methodist <laughs> <laughs> in the next episode.